Hello, Year 9. Last lesson, you were looking at Robert Peel and the setting up of the Metropolitan Police, the first police force in Britain. And we're going to do part two of that lesson today. So we're going to continue looking at Robert Peel and particularly focusing on some of the criticisms that the police received. But as a starter, I want you to look at the table below and think about what you know about the night watchman. You've done quite a lot of work on this over the units that you've covered. Uh, so I want you to compare the night watchman with the new police force using those ideas in the table below and write a paragraph summarising which features of the Metropolitan Police were carried over from the watch. In other words, what was similar or the same about the police and the night watchman in terms of the way they worked, they were organised and their role. So pause the video now and have a go at that silent starter. So here's our learning journey. And as you can see, we've reached the very end of our third unit. So there are four parts to crime and punishment arranged chronologically, and we've reached 1900. So the final part that we'll do, we'll be looking at going right up to the modern day, and we'll also take in Jack the Ripper and Whitechapel, which you did some work on um, pretty much this time last year in the summer term, actually last year. So our key learning question is what were the main penal reforms? That's the reforms to the punishment and policing system. And what were the main changes to policing led by Robert Peel? We mentioned that the public were very critical of the new police force. New police officers faced a hostile attitude from the public and the press. Cartoons portrayed them to some extent fairly as poorly trained, recruited from dubious backgrounds and having immoral tendencies. So what we mean by that is people complained that they weren't professional, that they were taken from criminal backgrounds, maybe, and that immoral tendencies, they were open to bribery and maybe drinking and that kind of thing. Early on, 2,800 recruits were signed up, but only 600 retained, would retain for more than a year. The most serious concerns people had about the new police force centred on fears of oppression. This means they thought the police would limit their individual freedom and they were worried that the police would be a military style presence on the, on the streets. They were also worried about the French style policing being introduced in Britain as Paris had notoriously repressive, a notoriously repressive centralised police force, and some people were also concerned about the increase of costs imposed on taxpayers for the new service. So basically, in simple English, people were worried that the police would be too heavy handed and interfere with their individual freedom. Uh, and that made people very wary. And they were also worried about the cost of the police force. Here's an example of what we were talking about. It's a letter of complaint about the London police's conduct written in 1830. Gentlemen, we are all so deeply interested in the good management and efficiency of the new police that I feel myself reluctantly bound to inform you of the misconduct of the superintendent in this division of Brixton, that's an area of London, by being on duty on Tuesday night in a state of intoxication. He's basically saying that the superintendent was drunk on duty. So Peel was aware of these criticisms and he was very keen to reduce public opposition to the police. Peel and his police commissioners understood the public concern about the introduction of the Metropolitan Police. The commissioners drew up and issued clear guidelines to all new police recruits. The principles, as they were called, included the following, which, will st which still provide the foundations of modern policing today. So if you look at the next slide, we can see the principles, a summary of the principles that Peel so let's have a look at these principles. Number one, the basic mission for which the police exist is to prevent crime and disorder. Number two, the ability of the police to perform their duties is dependent upon public approval of police actions. That just means the public had to agree with what the police were doing and the way they were doing it. Number three, police must secure the willing cooperation of the public in voluntary observation of the law to be able to secure and maintain the respect of the public. So in other words, the public had to buy in to following the law. It wasn't just about the police forcing it on them. This actually reminds me quite a lot of the rules about COVID and lockdown. If you think about it, we're asked constantly by the government to do the right thing and follow the rules rather than have the police go around making us follow the rules. The onus is supposed to be on us to make sure we follow the law. Number four, the degree of cooperation of the public can be secured that can be secured diminishes proportionately to the necessity of the use of physical force. 
What that means is the public are much less likely to support the police if they are violent and using violence to carry out their law enforcement. Number five, police seek and preserve public favour, not by catering to the public opinion, but by constantly demonstrating absolute service to the law. In other words, the police need to be seen to be fair and upholding the law. Number six, police use of physical force to the extent necessary to secure observance of the law or to restore order only when they exercise the exercise of persuasion, advice and warning is found to be insufficient. It's a very long winded way of saying police shouldn't really use physical force unless they absolutely have exhausted every other avenue like persuasion, advice and warning. Number seven, police at all times should maintain a relationship with the public that gives reality to the historical tradition that the police are the public and the public are the police. The police being only members of the public who are paid to give full time attention on every citizen in the interest of community welfare and existence. Again, a very long winded way of saying, look, the police are actually just like everybody else and uh, they need to you know, respect the fact that citizens are members of the police and police are also citizens. Number eight, police should always direct their actions strictly towards their functions and never appear to usurp powers of the judiciary. In other words, police should never take advantage of their powers. And number nine, the test of police efficiency is the absence of crime and disorder not the visible evidence of police action in dealing with it. So if the police are doing their job properly, crime and disorder will reduce. And it, that's what's really important rather than police being seen to be heavy handed uh, and very visible. So these principles quite kind of wordy, aren't they? Um, to make it clearer, you've got a mission now and you will need to download the Word document on Show My Homework. What you've got there is some statements basically that really reword the principles into plainer English and you need to see if you can match each of Robert Peel's nine principles to each of the statements simply by putting the number of the principle on the previous slide in the box next to the statement on the worksheet. So pause the video, download the Word document and have a go at that. It's quite a quick task. And the final thing we're going to look at this lesson is this idea that maybe Robert Peel um, was a humanitarian. So historians have suggested that Peel was a great humanitarian. What is a humanitarian? Well, humanitarianism is based on the idea that all people are equal and inhumane treatment to another human being should be challenged. So it's about fairness, treating people with respect and dignity. So was Peel motivated by this or not? Historians have offered a range of views concerning Peel's reasons for his reforms. Some argue that he was at least partly driven by this humanitarian motive, but others argue that he was concerned with setting up a punishment system that was more rational and effective, but not necessarily kinder or softer or more humane. Two interpretations on the next side really sum up these differences of opinion. So the first one is from a book called The Life and Legacy by Richard Gaunt, which was written fairly recently in 2010. He says this. Peel's criminal law reforms were not designed to result in less punishment, but in its more precise and efficient application. It follows from this that there would be no immediate downturn in capital executions. Remember, that's, he wasn't that means he wasn't expecting there to be less hangings. He may not have been a great hangman, but nor was he a great humanitarian. And the second interpretation is from a Victoria book called Victorian England, Portrait of an Age by G.M. Young, written quite a way back in 1936. He says this, Peel's frigid, that means unfeeling efficiency, covered an almost passionate concern for the welfare of people. So clearly, G.M. Young is arguing that Peel was motivated, was motivated by wanting to be fair and kind to people, a humanitarian, in other words. OK, so you're going to need to pause the video now and there's a set of tasks on this slide. In order to do the last task, you'll need to look at the cartoon. So do have a good look at this cartoon. It's quite entertaining in its way. It shows the police recruits all lined up and it's very critical of them. So basically it's taking the mickey of um, the new recruits into the police force and each of them have got a caption above their head. Now, I don't expect you to be able to read those captions. They're far too small, but I have summarised them on the next slide. 
So the first one's saying, please, sir, may I go backwards? I think that's basically trying to make out that the police is stupid. Uh, and in this case, he wants to walk backwards. The next one says, damn the vermin, by which he means things like rats. Ever since I've been in the force, they've stuck to me as close as my police coat. The next one says, I say, you police man, get a little further off. This is implying that the police were lice infested um, and that they were unclean. The next one, by Jesus, I wish your honour would give us a few throats to cut, for we have had enough of breaking heads. Clearly a reference to the police excessive use of violence. We'll do anything for money, a suggestion that the police will take bribes. I've had a regular attack of influenza, that's the flu, but it's dropping off by degrees. The suggestion perhaps is that they shirk their work by pretending to be ill. I was uh, in York House once before they took me. I wish I was back in York House uh, where they took me from, suggesting that some of the police perhaps came from poor houses. And I wish I was sweeping the crossing again. I used to get a wiper and a bit of articles now and then off passengers. Again, it's a reference to the fact that some of the police came from quite lowly backgrounds. The cartoon itself is called Reviewing the Blue Devils, referring to the police. Alias, that means, or otherwise called the Raw Lobsters or the Bludgeon Men. So again, the catch in itself suggests that it's being deeply critical of the police and again refers to the fact that police used excessive violence in carrying out their duties. So using the cartoon on the previous slide, see if you can match the captions to each policeman. It's very easy, they're in order, but it's just a way of getting you to look at the cartoon in a bit more detail. And then see if you can use the cartoon and the captions to write a few sentences to explain what were some of the main criticisms or problems that the police, the public had with the police at the time. So some of the captions might not make much sense to you, but you don't need to write about all of them. We get the impression of excessive use of violence, bribery, the fact that the police come from quite low backgrounds and perhaps that they're not very intelligent in the way they go about things. Remember the first one asking if he could walk backwards. When you've done that, there are just a few summary tasks on the final slide. And there they are. So pause the video and see if you can complete these tasks. Don't forget to send them to me via Show My Homework.